Okay. I hope uh, everybody's there again. Yeah. So <clears throat> I promised that in the second part, I would uh, like to speak about our work in hyperspectral imaging. Um, and this is work we've been doing at the Netherlands Cancer Institute over the last five years. In fact, last Friday, our first PhD student defended her thesis, and much of what you see here is done in collaboration with her. Her name was Esther Ko. <clears throat> okay, so I uh, already said that we do this by special hyperspectral cameras that give a full image for a large number of wavelengths, in con that in contrast to regular cameras that give uh, an image in the red, an image in the green, and one image in the blue. Th these cameras give uh, a whole stack of images in, uh, well, hundreds of wavelengths, basically as many as you want. Uh, now, how does it work? For instance, for a push broom camera, we have an object, but in front of the object, we put a slit, and only the slit transmits light, so we don't see the whole object. That light all goes to a dispersive element and is focused on the camera chip. So basically, the, there is an image of the slit on the camera, in the X direction, for each wavelength. So there is no imaging in the y direction, only in the x direction and in the wavelength direction. So that slit, that line image, is very limited. It's a, essentially a line image. And the second spatial dimension, we have to collect them by scanning the sample, for instance. Uh, and then the number of wavelengths that are in this hyperspectral camera is basically determined by the number of pixels in the wavelength direction. So can be easily hundreds of thousands. And the wavelength range is determined by the camera design. So basically your dispersive element and the sensitive of sensitivity of your camera chip. It's a slow acquisition. In principle, each image is fast, but you have to acquire uh, all these uh, different channels in the Y direction. It's not a very fast camera, but it's a very thorough camera. And an advantage, an example of it is given here. This is a line imaging camera, again, because there's a slit in front of the lens. And that is light that comes through the slit, goes to a dispersive element, and to focusing mirrors, and is imaged on the sensor. And then in the Y direction is in this direction, and the wavelength, I'm sorry, the X direction is in this direction, and the, this direction is the wavelength direction, so we get a full spectrum for each point on the x-axis, but none on the y-axis, only one on the y-axis. And that's, you have to do that by taking multiple images in diff different positions. For instance, that's done here. This is such a light scan camera. And uh, we see that the tissue sample is scanned through uh, the uh, the focus of the, of the camera. And uh, the camera just acquires images, so many per second. And then uh, that gives you a whole stack of images. Uh, the different images are the different images taken in different Y positions. So I end up with a cube that has a wavelength dimension, an X direction, and a Y direction. So the classical RGB images would be sections through this in the wide in the wavelength direction. Okay. Now, a different approach to hyperspectral imaging is what we call a snapshot camera. What is done? We know that that cameras have enormous amounts of pixels nowadays, way too many, if you ask me. And what they do is they sacrifice spatial resolution 
to wavelength resolution. What they do is they take, for instance, clusters of 16 pixels, and for each cluster, they have, for each pixel in that cluster, they have a different bandpass filter on the camera chip. Now that's, and they repeat that for every 16, cluster of 16 pixels. So if I have a, uh, let's say a regular two, 2K camera chip, then I have 2000 by 1000 pixels, but because I work in groups of 16, in, in clusters of 16 pixels, I would end up with a, a hyperspectral image of 16 wavelengths having 256 by 512 pixels. Um, the big advantage is that you have the whole spectrum being only 16 wavelengths now, the whole spectrum uh, in one shot, in one pixel, it's just one snapshot. Uh, the number of wavelengths and the wavelength range are again de determined by the chip design because you have to determine in advance which wavelengths you want. So probably if we talk about feature reduction, we, said we were talking about 10 to 15 feature uh, parameters in our intelligent feature reduction scheme. So we go from 2048 pixels in the spectrum to uh, let's say 16 parameters in our model from our model. So if if we could find the pixel in the wavelength, sorry, the, if we could find the wavelength that is specific to a parameter in our model, we might be able to work with these 16 wavelengths very well. But the problem is we don't know them in advance. So we will have to do the work first, then figure out which 16 or maybe 32 or in the worst case 64 uh, wavelengths would be important for our algorithm. And then we could order a snapshot camera like this. The problem with ordering snapshot cameras is that 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 this this type of electronic chips are made on wafers, and a wafer is two hundred thousand euros, and then you order sixteen or thirty two cameras. Uh, custom made cameras are not that easy to realize in this situation. So you have to know very well <laughs> what you will be ordering before you start making this type of highly integrated optics in, in these chips. Now there is, no matter how you do your uh, hyperspectral imaging with a snapshot camera or a line scan camera, push room, <clears throat> there is a difference with fiber optic spectroscopy that I want to illustrate here. So basically, if we shine light on the camera and we shine our camera, we, we aim our camera at the tissue. And for instance, I'm looking at a pixel that comes from, that's looking at this part of the tissue then this part of the tissue receives diffused light from all over the place. So also from locations from here, there, and there. Uh, but it also receives sub-diffused lights from locations very close. And it, uh, uh, it's a mixture of some, both sub-diffused and diffused lights. So that is a complication. It, we don't have that in... Uh, in fiber optic spectroscopy, there we can choose our fiber distance. Here, we have to deal with the fact that the, when the camera looks at the pixel, that is equivalent to your source, for, to your to your detection fiber in uh, in fiber optic spectroscopy. But the illumination spans all possible locations for your source fiber. So every point at the surface contributes to the reflection I measure here. Now, of course, this point, the light will have to travel very fast, will be attenuated strongly, but there is, a, there is an area uh, from which all the light coming out of this pixel has sampled. So this sampling volume is determined by uh, the optical property. So how well light from this location has been able to travel here. So when I have a high scattering or high absorption, I will have a very high resolution and I will only be looking at very small locations. And when I have a low absorption, uh, which happens in some wavelength regions, then I will be looking at, although my camera focuses on this pixel and the next pixel on the other pixel, it thinks it looks very sharp, 
it lo looks very focused to these pixels. The light that is received here comes from, is diffused and comes from a whole volume of tissue. So for instance, five to 10 pixels next to each other receive exactly the same amount of light. It will be literally like looking into the fog. No matter how expensive your camera is and no matter how many pixels there are in your camera, it still be, be a foggy image. And that's something we will have to deal with. Plus, we have the problem for our inverse algorithms that the diffusion theory is not valid because there is both subdiffuse reflection and diffuse reflection, but there's also diffuse reflection from close by and diffuse reflection from large distances that picks up information from all these inhomogeneities. So, uh, yeah, in hyperspectral imaging, uh, the, the, the way to diagnosis is less straightforward. So light image from a single pixel carries information from a larger volume. And in hyperspectral imaging, the sampling depth and the resolution are determined by the optical properties. And that's a little bit counterintuitive in the era where we always boast about the number of pixels in our camera. But when you look at diffuse light, then the, the fuse information will come from deeper in the tissue and will be blurred and doesn't care about how much money you spent on megapixel cameras. Okay, and there's another difference, and that is the specular reflection. So the um, in hyperspectral imaging, we see also light that bounces off the surface and goes directly in the camera. The disadvantage of specular reflection is that specular reflection is rather large compared to diffuse reflection. Now, specular re reflection from a refractive index change of, let's say, from 1, which is air, to 1.33 can be as large as 2%, while the diffuse reflection, although we call it 50 to percent, the diffuse reflection is usually much larger, usually much smaller. So full specular reflection will saturate a pixel. And we can see that very often in, uh, in uh, the specular reflection can only happen from one location where the reflection is absolutely uh, uh, going in exactly into that camera. So it's very ge geometry dependent. It's only this point where the, the the conditions are matched, but then the reflection is so large that it saturates the pixel. And that's a phenomenon we see very often. But when you have a non-flat surface, then we get some more complications that we call glare. Now, how do we define glare? Now, if I have the subdiffuse and diffuse reflection, that is light that has come into the tissue and then leaves the tissue in all kinds of directions, depending on the last time the light has scattered. If I have specular reflection, that is light bouncing off the surface uh, in a mirror-like way. So it's exactly following Fresnel's equations and depends on the, the refractive index change, but also on the angle of incidence um, and the orientation. Now, glare is something more complicated. Glare is specular reflection, it's reflection off the surface, but it goes in all directions. And it has to do with irregularities on your surface. So basically, when you look at uh, this under, under the magnifying glass, you see that this surface is flat. It's not polished. We don't polish our patients before we do a measurement. It's a little bumpy. And you have specular reflection in all kinds of directions. And that's what we call glare. It's a sort of a haze you get over the few surfaces that you can, 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 can see very often. Uh, gloss, it's called also in, uh, in, in makeup science and the paint science. Uh, but it's, it's also happening when you take a hyperspectral camera and look at a piece of tissue. And this is often confused with diffuse reflection. Let me go back one slide. This is often confused with diffuse reflection uh, because diffuse reflection comes from within the tissue. And uh, if you have these ray tracing programs that uh, are used for simulating computer graphics for computer games, they 
all consider the fused reflectance to come from the surface. There's never any uh, uh, transparency in the tissue. That's why computer images, artificially generated computer images, uh, always look a little bit different than, than real life. They haven't discovered it yet. While this, this knowledge is there, but they have, they apparently work in their own little bubble. Okay, now examples in real life. The fused reflectance, that's what you see when there's a dense fog. And to summarize what you see in a dense fog, there's nothing, it's just light. But if you look very carefully, you may see something coming from under the surface, but what's in the depth, you don't recognize it anymore. You only see the light. Now, specular reflection, that's what uh, we dream, we all dream of uh, having a nice specular reflecting car, but uh, uh, there's, it's less frequent, but, but it's also have these, we also have these uh, matted, uh, glossy, uh, car paints nowadays, and that's exactly what, what glare is. There is still some angular dependence, as you see, there's more glare here than it is there, but you clearly don't see any reflections anymore. Uh, you see vague uh, light uh, phenomena, but here you can see the clouds into the specular reflection. Here you don't, you just see some light. And that's uh, the three basic fund fundamental uh, phenomena we have to consider when we take a hyperspectral camera and look to tissue. Now, an example you see here, somebody hit uh, his finger with a hammer. Apparently it's swollen, it turns more red. And we know the red, more red means there is more blood in there. Uh, and we can see that because we look inside. But what we also see is these, this white line, which is basically glare. Uh, you, you can see it here and here, but here it's, it's, it's less intense. But when the, the, here the tissue is swelling, it stretches, so it gets more flat. Here it's a little bumpy uh, and the, the, there's not so much glare. Here the glare intensifies because, because there's swelling. It's, it's, and uh, you should realize that when uh, the glare changes, also the spectrum changes. Because we know the glare is nothing else than a form of specular reflection at the surface. And we know specular reflection goes with the refractive index and refractive indices don't change that dra dramatically eh? uh, for, for, the, for water and the air and fat and all these components in tissue. So the specular reflection has a very low wavelength dependence while the rest of the spectrum, the reflection spectrum does not. Uh, and that means that the total shape of your spectrum is influenced. Uh, now, the amount of specular reflection may contain information about the tissue composition at the surface layer. So these waves that, that uh, sense the refractive index to figure out how they should fulfill uh, Fresnel's equation, uh, they sample roughly a wavelength deep. So that's in the order of half a micron or a micron. That's not very deep. But in that surface layer, there may be water or there may be fat. And the refractive index of, of fat and water are different. And so are the specular reflections. Still, so depending on whether it is water or fat, there still is a difference in refractive index. So the amount of specular reflection is very interesting for us to figure out if that would be possible because that will tell us something about the tissue composition at the surface. Now, what's, what, what, what's the problem now? We will measure a number of spectra and then something will have varied, but how do we figure it out? Well, here we have an example of three artificially generated spectra with different amounts of tissue absorbers. You see scattering changes a little bit. And, uh, but here you see different spectra that are identical, but where the glare chip varied. Now we want to distinguish these two. Uh, that's something we figure out. So now with our hyperspectral camera, we have this problem of glare. So this is a, an, an artificially created RGB image from a, spec, from a hyperspectral hypercube. We just uh, put for this JPEG image, I just put 
three uh, random channels in the R, the G, and the B channel, and then you get a false color image. But you can see if you look at this square, I collected all the spectra in these pixels. You see there is an offset. The spectra all look very similar, not exactly similar. There's a little difference here, but the, the, the overall difference seems to be this, this offset. And we know that this apparent offset could be explained by different amount of glare. And if you look at the image here, you can already see it. There's these little intense spikes where the specular reflection is so high. When it goes too high, you get you saturating your pixels, then it turns totally white. Now there's others where it's less, but still it there's this whitish glow over it. And that is this amount of glare. And that's something that really, um, yeah, we have, in analyzing the spectra, we have a problem because, as I just said, we don't have inverse analytical models, modeling. So we don't have any uh, intelligent feature reduction possibilities at the moment. Uh, if we can, can separate these two, can separate the glare from the diffuse reflectance, we might be able to develop a model that is capable of doing this. Uh, so we really want to solve this problem. Now, one problem of getting rid of these artifacts by glare and also by, by other uh, variations in the spectra that I haven't described yet is called standard normal variant normalization. What that does is that takes each spectrum and it multiplies it by a constant and adds a constant and varies those two variables until the average is zero and the standard deviation is one. So you can see that here, this, it reduces this data set to this set of spectra, where the average is zero and the standard deviation of the, of the spectrum is all one. Now that, that is a risk, and as a biomedic, biomedical optics advocate, my heart is weeping when I see people do this, because in doing so, you throw away all the intensity information. And in the intensity information, there's a lot of information about the uh, 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 scattering. And we know scattering is also involved in the, the uh, process of developing cancer. So we would really regret that if that would be our only way out. But this has been done. So we reduce the glare artifacts by the standard normal variant method and then apply machine learning. Uh, yeah, so I said it, uh, it removes glare, it removes the absolute intensity and therefore scattering information, but also the refractive index information. So maybe uh, we look for something different first. Now, but there's one aspect to glare that may be important that we don't realize. And I try to illustrate that with, by these two pictures. Now, if your eye wants to focus, it needs sharp features. As I said, the diffuse light that is coming from the tissue is blurred because of the scattering. Uh, that's a little bit illustrated in the right picture, where you have a alabaster uh, uh, image a statue, a picture of an alabaster statue. An alabaster is highly scattering, nearly translucent, but but highly scattering, so not very absorbing, and you you can see uh, you you get the feeling it's a vague image because. For instance, the, 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 the eye here, you can hardly focus on it. I can focus on, on, on the edge here, because there I have something sharp. Here, I don't have sharp information. Uh, and it's not my camera. It's, it's the original that doesn't present any sharp image. On the other hand, if I look at the other Madonna, uh, you see all kinds of surface features that uh, make this... Uh, very easy for your auto, auto focus in your camera to focus on. You should try this if you're in the, in the museum to make a use your autofocus to make a picture of this. It's very difficult. Your, your camera has problems with this. Here, this is this is easy. There's all these sharp features, but all these sharp features are on the surface. So maybe surface features are contain information. I mean, in this case, it certainly contains information. Uh, but for our cancer detection problem, 
maybe surface features contain information too, not just the refractive index, but also the, the shape of the surface. And we don't want to uh, remove that. So we don't want to remove glare like the standard normal variant normalization, but we want to separate it from the fuse reflection. And for that, we have developed the following experiment. So we have a piece of tissue, we have a camera, and we have our lamp. We put the light on, we have specular reflection from the surface, we have glare going in all directions, and we have the fuse reflections and subdiffuse. Now that's imaged. Uh, and then we move the lamp, and we have the same thing, and we have another image, and we repeat that a number of times. But you see that by varying the illumination angle, uh, we can vary the contribution of glare. The amount of diffuse light will remain the same, but the amount of glare strongly depends on the orientation of the incident light with respect to the surface irregularities. So it will be a different number. So in theory, we take a number of these images under different angles, we might be able to, to, to solve that. Now, as an example, I show you uh, images of three different angles of illumination here. You see this, the, the, the overall shape is the same. It is the same type of tissue. But uh, for instance, this white glare pixel is not present here. And this white pixel is not present here. So, and here they're both not present. Uh, you see here, you see three pixels and here you see only one. And here you see a very dim one. So indeed, if I move my, uh, my lens light source, the overall diffuse image won't change, but the surface reflections will, will change. And that will give me an opportunity, hopefully, to reduce the glare. Well, and I did so. I developed a simple algorithm for it. And this is the result. So it's already much better. Now, what was the simple algorithm? Well, I simply took the minimum of these three pixels. So I created a new image, and each pixel was the minimum of the three pixels in each uh, 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 image. And then simply, I selected the one with the least glare. Unless there's always glare, and then there's a little bit less. So I, we might, I still think that this has still some glare because there are some highly, um, some bright features in this still. Uh, <clears throat> now, it does give me an opportunity to say something about the glare as an information source. So these three images are now reduced to one subdiffuse image, diffuse and subdiffuse image, and one image that contains all glare information. Now, it doesn't look like much yet, but but uh, you can imagine that that um, the the flatness of the, the, the of the tissue may give a clue on the balance between the surface tension and the mechanical properties. So we know, for instance, that that's what the surgeon tells us that he if he wants to find out where the tumor is before he cuts it out, he can feel it. A tumor is more solid, is more than the fatty tissue around it. So you can imagine that this region where you have sharp features and this region where you have no sharp features, that this is more the more the more uh, soft tissue, the more the, 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 the more fatty tissue in here as well. And that here you have pockets of tissue with, with tougher mechanical properties. That may be information as well on uh, the, the state of the tissue. We don't know that yet. But <clears throat> we're now developing this method further to see if we can start applying this and first to get rid of glare as an, as an unwanted artifact, but second to see if we can uh, dig up information from it. So we've been using this in breast cancer surgery. now. Um, what happens with a patient that has the diagnosis breast cancer? Well, there's two main groups. One is the, when there's no metastasis. In the past, uh, people were treated, the people are still treated with surgery, but in the past, it was a complete mastectomy, completely removing the, the breast. And those patients had a very good survival. Uh, people with a 
metastatic disease, so distant seeds of the cancer in, in, in other locations, that's a different ballgame. You, you have to do chemotherapy and the, basically the diagnosis is too, not too late, but, but um, they have a much worse outlook than when you're there where the tumor is still localized in the breast. So in the past, the whole breast was removed and it had an excellent outlook for the patient. <coughs> Patients didn't like that very much. Complete mastectomy did save their lives, was the idea, but um, yeah, you had to live on without a breast. And especially for the younger women, it was not very attractive. So surgeons started to do surgery more conservatively in the sense that we have now developed a breast conserving surgery approach uh, with excellent survival, which means 95% at five years, which is the same as with mastectomy. And you can argue whether that is, why that is not 100%. It is probably that in these cases, patients already had metastasis, but they were not found at the time of diagnosis, which of course is a pity, but that's solving that is a different problem. But the problem with the breast conserving surgery, which of which there are now 50, 500,000 done in Europe and the United States annually. So that's a lot of surgery. About, yeah, a little bit more than a third is incomplete, which means that the lump that contains cancer is resected with a margin out of the tissue, out of the tissue that is sent to the pathologist. And the pathologist takes about a week to look at it, and then something is found. The tumor is found, tumor cells are found. And then the, the patient gets additional radiotherapy or additional surgery. It's a nightmare for the patient. It's a dilemma for the surgeon because, yeah, he has the feeling that he didn't cut away en enough tissue. So very likely, so the next time he will cut more tissue. So very likely, uh, and, and we know that for sure, in the other 63% of patients, they remove too much tissue. In fact, we know that they remove three times more tissue than would be strictly necessary. Uh, yeah, and it's expensive to do all this and it's a nightmare for the patients. And yeah, there's a, there's a lot of extra costs that we haven't been able to track, but, uh, and it frustrates everybody because yeah, it's a dilemma, cut out more, and, and have a cosmetic problem and generate additional costs in that field or uh, cut out less and take the risk of having needing additional treatment. So this would be a good place for new technology to maybe to help answer the question. So again, to illustrate, this is how the problem looks. Right? You can imagine that this is not easy, although there is very good CT scans and MRIs available that exactly delineate the tumor. As soon as you start to do the surgery, you completely deform, mechanically deform the problem and the, 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 the preoperative images are worthless. Color is the same. So the surgeon has to work by his eyes and his fingers. So they can sometimes feel the tumor a little bit. And if you cut away too much, then you get positive resection margins and additional treatments. And when you cut too much, then yeah, you get a bad cosmetic result. So how does it work right now? You do the surgery, you remove the lump. The lump is sent to the pathology department. They paint it on the outside with different paints. So uh, the surgeon puts a, a stitch at the nipple side and at the foot, the feet, the side of the feet. So the pathologist knows the orientation. On that hand, you can see here the, the arrow points to the point where, the, where the, 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 the stitch that was put in by the surgeon comes out. So they know the orientation, then they slice it in a particular manner, and uh, then they make micrometer thin slices that they stain chemically, and they put them under the microscope. So this is a process that takes a couple of days, but you can still see that the paint on the outside of the micron slices, it's green or orange or blue, 
uh, or black. And so they know from where in the breast it comes. They look at it under the microscope and determine whether there is cancer close to the margin. And as I said, it takes about a week. And in 37% of the cases, the lady hears that they have a problem. Uh, and then they get, some of them get additional surgery, and but most of them get, uh, get additional radiotherapy. <clears throat> and yeah, this is uh, preventable. If we would have an inferior technique that could do a little bit better than the surgeon, you know, we would already uh, save this procedure half of the time. It would be worthwhile doing. So uh, let's see. So how would uh, do we do this at the moment? So the surgeon removes this little lump. As I said, it gets painted and sliced by the pathologist. Then we put, we take one of these standard plastic cassettes. Uh, we put black rubber in there. We put a one of the slices in there, and we know the tumors in the middle. We take a hyperspectral image. We take an RGB image for our reference. Then. The pathologist stains, yeah, takes a slice off the surface of 10 micron, stains this chemically. Then he spends an hour painting the tissue with different types of tissue. So this is the, the red is invasive carcinoma. The pink is carcinoma in situ. The light blue is fat and the dark blue is uh, uh, connective tissue. Um, yeah, and then we have we will correlate our image with a hyperspectral image. In the beginning, we just took some regions of interest of areas where we knew the diagnosis, and then you can see spectra in this region look like this, the spectra in this pink region where we had carcinoma in situ look like this, etc. So this is normal tissue, and this is etc. Connective fat, adipose fat tissue. So we can build up a database. Uh, no. And then we do the pre-processing assessing is, is uh, uh, the standard normal variance analysis, uh, normalization. And then we do a support factor machine. We train that uh, to get a, 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 a classifier and we do that a number of times so we get uh, because we have a training set and a validation set so we we rotate that we do five iterations so we have five similar but slightly different trained algorithms and we do we test that on a separate test set and then we get a performance of our classification now some more examples of what we do so we have a white light image of our sample this is how the pathology looks, and this is how the pathology classifies the tissue. <clears throat> and this is how our algorithm classifies the tissue. So you can see it's, it's, it's not bad. It, it looks like it has less resolution. Here you see a tiny little um, field of um, uh, carcinoma in situ, and it is much bigger here. And, uh, but that that's, may have to do with the diffuse nature of the light. Well, it speaks for itself. It's 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 reasonably good. It's not perfect, but it seems to work reasonably well. Now, why it reason works reasonably well and not perfect has to do with boundary effects. Now, here you see a very sharp delineation between these types of tissue, and in the pathologist's judgment, well, you do a rough line, but you can see there is parts entering the tissue that are very very different types of tissue, uh, uh, islands of normal tissue in there, and plus you sample this with diffuse light. You can imagine that a few millimeters uh, of diffusion will already uh, yeah, mix the two signatures of the two types of tissue. So it is, it is very logical that you have a, an edge around the tumor in which the, the algorithm, yeah, uh, is uncertain simply because the, the the hyperspectral image is not sharp enough. So that's that's one problem. And the secondary problem that that comes from that when you don't have a big tumor but a, a large number of small ones, 
yeah, that you have more boundary areas and you get more uncertainties, and that uncertainties means classification errors. So that is a problem, and we started to investigate sort of a critical pocket size that you need. Uh, of the, the, yeah, how the pocket size would influence the classification accuracy. So the, for the very large uh, uh, areas of cancer or normal or connective tissue or ductal carcinoma in situ or invasive carcinoma, yeah, you have 100% accuracy, no problem, easy. But when the pockets become smaller, then you see the first one to deviate is the invasive carcinoma. So it's an eight by eight millimeter chunk of invasive carcinoma is already, you get some classification area, uh, errors. And that is because when tumors get large, they, they become inhomogeneous. And there's little pieces of, for instance, fat or connective tissue embedded in the, in the tumor. And that gives an uncertainty in your classification. Ductal carcinoma in situ, yeah, connective tissue, same story. Fat is always very easy to recognize because of the specific spectrum it has. But when uh, connective tissue, ductal carcinoma in situ, get uh, uh, smaller pockets, the accuracy drops up to you know, unacceptable low levels. And the critical threshold for, let's say, 95% accuracy in cancer is about two millimeter. Now, this two millimeter isn't that awkward. Now, from an imaging point of view, from a megapixel camera, seeing only two millimeter sharpness in your camera would make you weep. But um, what the surgeons and pathologists have agreed uh, is called so-called clinical guidelines. Now, when is a, a margin, a surgical margin considered positive in breast cancer? And that is when there are no tumor cells in the top two millimeters of the tissue. So that is why we think this two millimeter area is so important because eventually when we start to use the technique before the surgeon uh, has cut out or when we look at the lump, not at the sliced samples, but at the lump of tissue from the outside, we don't want any two millimeter sharpness is good enough because that's how deep we want to look. Now, and then you can, can uh, make a classification performance again in sensitivity and specificity and accuracy. And, uh, oh, I see this is not accuracy, but area under the curve, but it's similar to accuracy. You can see that detecting fat is uh, very, we were very good in detecting fat. Now, too bad because clinicians can recognize fat very easily because it's so soft. Now, more difficult is to distinguish ductal carcinoma in situ, which is, which is early small strands of cancer and connective tissue. And that is simply because ductal carcinoma in situ is in the middle of connective tissue. So this, these are always mixes of, of, of each other. Invasive carcinoma, is easier to do with a very high specificity. I mean, when you say it's invasive carcinoma, it's nearly always invasive carcinoma, nothing else, but sometimes you miss a little bit. But if you realize that surgeons are only accurate in 63% of the cases, a method like this would do great. It would, it would, yeah, your if your accuracy this is area under the curve, but if your overall accuracy would be 95%, we would do a lot better than the 63% that surgeons obtain now. So that's that's uh, the, the, there's a, there's a lot of gain we can can make, and you could you could tweak the algorithm towards a higher sensitivity, for instance. So if we could tweak the sensitivity to 100% and thereby sacrifice some specificity then the surgeons could be extremely conservative in removing cancer. So they could aim at a positive margin and then use the technique to peel off the positive regions, which means that you would have less, not only have less uh, uh, positive margins, 
and reoperations, but also you would remove a lot less tissue. So even in the normal cases where we don't have positive margins, we the, the surgeon would re, would obtain a much better cosmetic result, and that's of immense important importance to the patients. So we have options here. There's, there's, this is really promising, but we have to. Uh, uh, yeah, may not be perfect, but it is certainly an improvement, and we're working towards launching this into the clinic. Now, one of the first things we started doing is looking at the full lump. So one way of, of using this technique is not to guide the surgeon directly, but to be faster than the, the pathologist. The pathologist takes a week to say what was going on. After a week, the surgeon, uh, the, the patient's already back home. So you cannot go back, if you go back to, to remove some more tissue, it's a new operation. But if you could do it in five minutes, while the patient is still in the operating room, the surgeon could have a coffee uh, and you could tell him, listen, in that corner, you've left something. You have to remove something else there. So, but then we should, uh, uh, we have to, uh, we can image the, the lump that the surgeon has removed from the outside and see what's going on. Now we develop the algorithm on the slices so we have an enormous database. The advantage of working on the slices is that you're looking from the side of the cross-section of the sample, and each pixel represents a different type of tissue that you can, of which you can have uh, on the pathology slide. You can see what type of tissue it is. So we have a, a huge database. And the algorithm applied, uh, developed on that huge database, we applied it on images we took from six sides from the sample. Now these samples are not very are rather soft, so they deform when you when you change them shape. So we we haven't reconstructed a three D surface from that. We're working on that right now, but we put them in a in a in a, in a cube. And so these six images were put in a cube, and the algorithm was released on it to show where the cancer is. <clears throat> now this is the result, and surgeons were very enthusiastic about this because. Although it's far from operational, far from perfect, it would tell them immediately or after five minutes because it's a clumsy hyperspectral camera and it's a mechanical scanning and the algorithm takes still takes a, a minute or so to to generate the, uh, the diagnostic images. But still, uh, th those are not fundamental problems. That's uh, you can solve them by throwing money at it, and that's some medical device company will do that at some time and then. It's solved, but the very concept that you could take the sample in, and have this information available while the patient still under 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 anesthesia, waiting to be to receive their additional uh, resectioning, that would be a major step forward. And as I said, we're working hard on that to uh, to realize that. Now the next step would be to do it in vivo to help the surgeon decide wh where to, to cut before he has made a mistake. <clears throat> now that's also always very valuable, but you can imagine that using a any type of camera, let alone a, a push boom camera in a horrible environment like this is very difficult to realize. So, um, yeah, if you illuminate here, then you get shadows and and it's very difficult to find back where the tissue was a minute ago because everything moves and so what we will do we will develop a surgical tool which is a hand probe um, not with an imaging device on top of it but with fiber optics and uh, because we want to still do some kind of imaging <coughs> we use a fiber optic probe with a number of fibers so we can scan a large area and the distance of these fibers was chosen in such a way that that uh, you're sampling two millimeters deep uh, so we are, we are looking at the resection margin only and not below the resection margin because this 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 surgical margin that we want to investigate of two millimeters we know there's cancer below it so if you look too deep you always see cancer and you're not helping so you want to look at two millimeter deep only and not deeper and that's why we put these fibers, the source fibers in the middle here. And we put these fibers 
sorry, the detector fibers in the middle here, and we put these six source fibers around it. They switch on one by one. So we have in, in six segments around the, the source fiber, we have information of the state of the tissue. And in total, we investigate a, an area which is, is roughly six, six by six millimeters. And yeah, that's, that's what the, in discussions with the surgeons we came up with. Now, as I said, oh, this, this slide's in the wrong order. It should be, should be uh, uh, put behind the previous uh, uh, topic. So if you want to do this during surgery, you can do it ex vivo uh, just after, after the surgery, and you would tell the surgeon while the patients are still there. Now, this looks, looks like a guy, and that's been doing breast cancer, so that's not, that's not correct. But anyway, uh, yeah, the, the image would be displayed a couple of minutes after the lump was removed. And if we want to do it in vivo, we are doing the first in vivo patients as we speak. Uh, and that's work in progress. So, um, elastic scattering spectroscopy. So we have very high promising results for medical applications, but there's also lots of non-medical applications in the food environment and in the security. Uh, uh, in the food industry, uh, but basically people are sampling uh, the ripeness of fruit or evaluating how fresh a steak is. Uh, a couple of years ago, a company even won uh, a prize because they could detect how fresh fish was. Uh, at some point, you can smell how fresh fish, fish is, but um, then it's too late. Then you can no longer serve it in a restaurant. Uh, but uh, yeah, in the first couple of days you don't smell it. And if you want to know whether it was really caught this morning or caused a, caught a couple of days ago, then you could really do that with elastic scattering spectroscopy. Uh, and yeah, there's, the non-medical applications are booming, but medical applications, yeah, elastic scattering spectroscopy by its it's ultimately cheap uh, nature. You need LEDs, you need cameras. It it's, doesn't cost anything. Can be on, a, on an iPhone, can be in personal care to see if you need a doctor or for a doctor to investigate whether he can uh, refer a patient to a specialist. And then at the specialist, uh, you can use it dur during diagnostic procedures to biopsy needles or to endoscopes to guide the biopsy or just do the biopsy by light. So not remove any tissue, but I mean, with Raman spectroscopy, for instance, you get a bunch of, a bunch of chemical information, which is, which is incredible. Uh, if you could do that, that would really make the pathology obscure, which is, um, uh, although pathologists are maybe hesitant to, 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 uh, uh, agree with this, but it's it's basically a century-old uh, technique. They, they've developed new microscopes and new staining techniques. And there was a lot of innovation there, but it's still basically a person looking through an eyepiece and saying, yeah, I think this is cancer. Uh, but it might be, and then for, for some diseases, they even have sets of pathology slides that are sent around the world to, to get uh, different reviews by different pathologists to obtain a consensus. I mean, it's not an exact science. And by uh, the more chemical-based analysis, as we, we can do optically, you could turn this into a more exact science. But apart from diagnostics, you could also use it for therapy guidance to, to, to find the disease, where to, where to apply your therapy and where not, to check for if there is more disease or a disease left. And that gets more into therapy monitoring to evaluate the procedure to, to is it effective? Is it, is it working still? To, for instance, in, in, in chemotherapy, the dose that chemotherapy patients receive is, is based on a clinical trial that was done 10 years ago on an average group of patients. And it is, uh, it's known that there are more sensitive patients and less sensitive patients. And because of the less sensitive patients, everybody is overdosed. Now, if you could measure the concentrations of your chemotherapeutic agents 
optically, you could do individualized uh, uh, treatments. Uh, very, very powerful op opportunities there. And you could monitor the follow-up of therapy. Is it working? Do I quickly respond with an extra dose or do I quit earlier because this patient's already cured and it's no use giving more therapy? You could also check for recurrences. So there's a, a host of applications uh, coming up. Now, because uh, it's three o'clock and uh, you guys would love to work until six this evening, uh, uh, or even all night. I have a small assignment on glare removal, and I hope Dirk still has that in store. Yeah, it's on uh, Canvas already. Yeah, okay. So you can download it, and I would ask you to s send the uh, the answer uh, to uh, the email address uh, that's indicated, preferably before tomorrow morning. So, so I don't want you to work on this for weeks, because uh, we have been working on it for about a year now, so it's no use uh, spending all your spare time on it. But I would like to have your 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 first ideas and work out your idea as far as you can get. Uh, I'm very interested in the way you think you can solve this. So thank you very much. And if there's any questions, I would love to answer them. Or did everybody fall asleep? Apparently. OK. Well, then I'm looking forward for your emails. <clears throat> All right, Dick, thank you. OK. Well, goodbye. Thanks, bye-bye. OK. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.